The meditation for this evening comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, the 14th chapter. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And in three days I will build another, not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. This is the end of the lesson appointed for this evening. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight we reflect on the fact that through our eyes the flesh conjures up all manner of murderous desire. And not only do our eyes incite us to the murder of our neighbor, but our hearts are so twisted and corrupted by sin that we are far more likely to justify and explain away our murderous intentions than we are to recognize them, confess them, and receive forgiveness for them. As an example of how this works, we have before us this description of Jesus' captivity under the Jewish leaders before he's handed over to Pilate. You may recall that the reading begins with a description of how this event occurs during the Passover festival and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Undoubtedly, this reminds us that Christ himself has come to fulfill the promises of God to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And no sooner had he come to this festival than the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. Like so many fallen sinners, their eyes saw what they wanted to see in Jesus. They were jealous of him because he had received the praise and adoration of so many in Israel. They despised his teaching that sinners were saved not through the tradition of the elders and the presumed merits therein, but rather through faith. They also despised Jesus' teaching that he was the fulfillment of so many Old Testament Christological promises. And they wanted nothing more than to be rid of him. When they looked at Jesus, they just wanted to kill him. And so they set a plot to have him captured. When Jesus is brought before them, in reality, they really do the most natural thing with him. They look for any and every reason to blame him. They want to find a reason to justify their own indignation. They are not going to recognize their own sins. They're not going to confess that what they're doing is wrong. And they definitely see no need for forgiveness in what they're doing. 
They want to justify the murderous desires of their eyes. And they will do this by trying to convince themselves and everyone else that what their eyes are telling them about Jesus is true, even though it's not. So they drag out all these witnesses. And there are more than enough who are willing to tell the chief priests and the elders and the scribes all that they want to hear. What accords with their foolish sight? The only problem is all these witnesses don't agree. Even when it comes to the intentional distortion of Jesus' words about this destroying of the temple and its rebuilding, they can't keep their testimony straight. The false witnesses seem to be so bad that finally the high priest just decides to interrogate Jesus himself. So he asks the man he wants to kill, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus, who is the only one whose testimony is true, replies, I am! And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus gives the honest, truthful answer. And the high priest, he's like enraged. Because when he looks at Jesus, he doesn't see what he believes or thinks should be the Christ. All his eyes tell him is that this man blasphemes and is worthy of death. It's kind of sad when you think about it. Because before the high priest stands Jesus who is God in the flesh, come to serve this broken and sinful world. But this world and all its people, they don't want to be saved by God. They want to be their own gods instead, whose only justification comes by their own words and their own works. That's the way it was at the time of the fall. That's the way it was at the time of the handing over of Christ. And that's the way it still is today. We sinners, like the high priest, don't naturally want a merciful God in Jesus Christ. We hate that. We would rather kill that sort of God and replace him with ourselves. And that's true. It really is of us. Like those who plotted to kill Jesus, we see what we want to see with our sinful eyes. We look for the bad in others. We try to find fault with them, even if there really isn't any to be found. We will invent all manner of gossip and ill will so that we can justify the wicked and vengeful desires of our hearts. When we look out at others, it's natural for us to see them as always bad and us as always good. And given the right time and circumstances, it would be us crying out for the death of our neighbor, and even more so for the death of our God. Sometimes that's hard to believe because we think so highly of ourselves. But the only difference between us and those who we hear about in our gospel text tonight is time, place, and circumstance. Our hearts are no better than theirs. Because our sinful flesh and that gaze of our sinful eyes, it's just as broken, corrupt, and murderous. And our Lord Jesus Christ, he knows this about us. He knows that when we see others in the world, we do not have his good and just desires for them. He knows our murderous thoughts. And that is why Jesus has come to embrace those things. Embrace them not by telling us that those things are okay or that they're not so bad. That's what the world does. Jesus embraces them by actually taking their guilt into himself. He embraces them by allowing himself to be on their receiving end. Jesus has come that humanity might do its worst to him. Because unlike us, Jesus wants to murder no one. He harbors no evil thoughts or intentions, even towards those who want to kill him in the flesh. He also harbors no such murderous thoughts toward us. Quite the opposite. Jesus wants to save us and them and all people from the sin that would consume us unto death. This is why he goes like a lamb 
to the slaughter during the Passover festival. Something must be given as an atonement sacrifice for our sins of death and murder. Something must die in our place because we're the ones who deserve the sentence of death for the death that we desire for others. And that something given is the promised Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He will allow himself to be murdered in order to rescue every murderer. It's why he will take the place of the likes of Barabbas. The whole wrath of God that he doesn't deserve, that will fall upon Jesus as if he were the greatest murderer who ever existed. Jesus must become, in the eyes of God, the greatest sinner of all. For only by such a plenary substitution and atonement can the sins of all be paid for. And paid for they are. Because the death of Jesus, that the leaders of the Jews so much desire, is exactly what comes about. And when Christ dies, he dies for you and me and those who killed him. He dies for everyone. Every evil thought, every harmful word, every murderous look and action has been paid for. And in return, he gives the remission of our sins and the righteousness of God through faith. In this sacrificial body and blood of Christ has come the payment price for our sins. A righteous death in our place. And now Christ gives this death to us. He attributes his own death to us so that we look like we've actually justly died to our sins. Imagine that. We deserve to die for our murderous gazes. But instead of having to die forever and be banished from the love of God for all eternity, God chooses to look at us through his son. That's what he sees. And he chooses to see us as dead to sin and alive to the righteousness of God in him. That's exactly what happens when we are baptized. We are buried with Christ, as if it were us who hung on that cross and were placed into that tomb. Jesus drowns our old Adam daily through the promise of the word of God and the water of holy baptism. And each day we arise anew to live as that repentant, contrite, and trusting people that God has called us to be. And now, we live set free from the ruling power of sin and the eternal judgment of God over it. To live as those who truly live in the Son of God. We live to no longer see the world according to the murderous gaze of the flesh but with a view to the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. To see the world from the love of God that has been given in the perfect life and perfect death of the Son of God. Yes, there will be sin and evil in the world. We will see it sometimes even work through ourselves. But this is not properly who we are any longer. Instead, we have held before our eyes the righteousness of Christ won for us at the cross and given to us in our baptism. We see ourselves as the people of God, called and washed from our sins. And we look out and we see a broken world and fallen corruption, but it is a world for which Christ himself has died. And we know that whatever we face in the world, we do so as those who are not destined to perish eternally without hope, but those whose hope is certain because of the forgiveness of sins we have received and the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you find your old flesh trying to make you look at the world with murderous eyes, may that new man in you look to the crucified Christ instead, where your true hope and life is found, here in this life and forever in life eternal. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us now rise as we continue with the singing of the canticle on page 231. <laughs> 